Welcome back, everybody. Uh, thanks again for attending, and we will start the workshop. Uh, thank you very much. All right, we we'll have some new faces. So, um, for those of you who are new, my name is Mina Chetinkaya Rendell, and I do a lot of things, but two of which are I'm a faculty member at Duke in the Stats Department. And I also work with our studio as an educator as well. So the workshop that we're going to go through today is a combination of the two types of work I do. Um, I've been teaching R for a number of years at this point, and I personally really enjoy data visualization. So today we're going to talk about the ggplot2 package. Um, I, the slides that I'm going to go through are at this link. Um, I'm usually pretty good and will put things at the footer of my slides, but I'm just realizing that this time I forgot to do that. So you don't necessarily have to have the slides open. We're going to have you work in our studio at some point, but I know some people like having the slides open in front of them. So I'm going to give you a second to copy this URL, rstd.io, like our studio, uoc-ggplot2-slides. So that's going to get you to a rendered version of these slides. I made these slides with an R package called Sheringen, and when I give you the um, link to the repository, the slides are there as well. You don't have to care about them, but if you like making your slides in an HTML-friendly format, this is one that I've been enjoying using, despite the fact that I'm still not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> um, all right, so does everyone who wants the link to the slides have it? Okay, great. So let's talk a little bit about data visualization. I can't do say something about data visualization without quoting Tukey, I suppose. So this one quote that I really like is that the simple graph has brought more information to the data analyst's mind than any other device. So that's that's the simple graph that we're going to build today. The, when I talk about data visualization, what I mean is it is really the creation and study of the visual representation of data. We're going to focus more on the creation today because, to be perfectly honest, two hours is not a long enough time to both do syntax and an in-depth analysis. But along the way, I will be asking you, there are some exercises that we'll be asking you to work on. And we hope that you'll like kind of pair up and work with the person next to you or around you, um, we'll be asking you some questions where we say, well, this doesn't look like a great representation of this data. Why? And how can we make it better? So while the focus is a bit on the syntax here in terms of learning how the package works, I think the motivation is going to come from this is not what we would want to represent the data as. How do we get ggplot2 to, to do what we really want it to do? Um, there are many tools for visualizing data. R is only one of them. And within R, there are many packages and systems for visualizing data. ggplot2 is only one of them. The reason why we're doing ggplot2 today is a variety of reasons. Um, one of them is that um, it is a very commonly used plotting package. And um, it is popular for a reason. It makes beautiful graphs out of the box. And, while base R plotting, so without using the ggplot2 functionality, without using loading any special packages in R, you can build plots as well, and you can make incredibly like beautiful plots that way as well. I do believe that it takes a lot more effort to get to that point versus the out of the box style of ggplot2 looks a little bit more modern. So it doesn't take as much work on your end to build these like beautiful plots. Now I'll be honest, that does mean that it is quite opinionated. As um, and what, when things are opinionated, what happens is breaking those opinions and getting out of them, while always possible when you're writing code, can be more challenging. So you might hear, like, ggplot2 isn't as versatile. I don't know that I would characterize it as much, but it does make it harder for you to do something it doesn't want you to do, that it wasn't designed to do. There's always a way around it, but I think it makes sense, at least for today's workshop, we're going to focus on not trying to break ggplot2, but actually work within the confines of it, which are vast anyway, that uh, there's a lot to learn there before you would hit the edges and feel like, no, this is really not what I wanted to do. How can I break it? Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> Stupid internet. Uh, we'll figure this out. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I will tend to the just a few. I don't think that's the um, actual images not showing up. Um, it's just the embedded images that are not showing up. So I will deal with those um, later. Yeah. So I will um, present from here for now, and then I can deal with that. Make sure it shows up in the repo. Um, well, later. So ggplot2 is part of the tidyverse uh, packet suite of packages. How many of you have heard of the tidyverse? Good. We have pretty good coverage. So um, tidyverse is an is an opinionated set of packages and ggplot2 is one of them and it is the visualization package in there. The gg stands for grammar of graphics and if you are interested in kind of really understanding the grammar of graphics I would strongly recommend this book uh, by Leland Wilkinson, The Grammar of Graphics which actually introduces the terminology that we're going to be using and uh, talks about how these layers are created and originally had Lee Wickham, now a team of people work on the ggplot2 package and it is inspired by kind of the philosophy laid out in this book. So if you get genuinely interested in kind of finding out why was it designed this way, that's a really wonderful read. In general, learning about data visualization philosophy, I think it's a great read as well. And it also, once you read it, really makes you appreciate, ah, oh, I see now why I have to do it this way. Um, so it's a tool that enables concise description of components of a graphic. So we're always kind of thinking about the components and we're going to be thinking about in these layers and thinking about manipulating each of the layers and then layering them on top of each other with the plus sign to kind of create our graphs. In terms of following along today, you have two options. If you are already a our user and you would like to use your local setup and I will say that uh, while everything that we're doing does not necessarily require our studio because we're working off of an our markdown document it will be easier if you're working in our studio to do so so if you have already R and R studio installed and you prefer to work with your local version this is the link that I would like you to go to it should take you to the repository where these materials are saved so it's that same beginning, rstud.io, QOC, ggplot2, and then repo as the last word in there. So um, this is where we're going to. Um, so I'm going to wait a second for people to um, copy down that link. How many of you are planning to work locally? The other option is working on the cloud. Okay, so we definitely have some local users. Those of you who are wanting to work locally, do you have, have you reached the repository that this link points to? Yes? yes. Okay, so let me kind of, um, so the materials themselves are saved in this repository, which is a GitHub repository. This workshop does not require or expect that you know anything about Git or GitHub, and we will not be using version control for the sake of this workshop. This just happens to be where I posted my materials for your purposes. Um, if you know your way around GitHub, you probably know what the word clone means, and if that's what you want to do, you should do that. If you don't, what I would uh, recommend that you do is to download everything. So I clicked on this green button and download it as a zip, which is going to create a zipped folder with the name of this repository. Um, UOCGGplot2 was the name of the repository. And once you open that um, file, I would like you to open it by clicking, double clicking on this rproj file. So, how many of you here uh, use RStudio projects? Okay, how many of you use RStudio? Okay, so I would like to accomplish one thing today that has nothing to do with data visualization. If you raised your hand in the second step saying I do use RStudio, I would, very, I would be very happy and let me promise you that you will be very happy if going forward you only use RStudio projects to access your documents. Yeah? I use RStudio. What's that? I use RStudio. You do use it from the projects, and and what what do you like about it? Mm, it's more intuitive, and I can see the code about what happened in the on the panel behind it. 
Right, so when you use RStudio projects and you launch a project by double clicking on this, what it does is it creates a new RStudio session for you. This way you can have multiple RStudio sessions open so you could be to, uh, working, in, working on multiple projects at the same time with keeping their histories and workspaces um, separate which I think is incredibly useful and it always lands you in the correct working directory for the rest of your analysis. So that's why if you have a folder where you have some R scripts and you're going to be running those in RStudio, turn it into an RStudio project which will basically place this file here, the rproj file, and going forward work off of that. If you also use RStudio in conjunction with Git, you kind of have to use RStudio projects anyway for things to play nice. Okay, so for those of you who are wanting to work locally, have you grabbed all of the documents that you, or did you download the zipped folder? Do you have a local version of this stuff? So the document, the, what I would like you to do is launch the project by clicking on the rproj file, which will launch an RStudio um, IDE for you, and simply open the ggplot2.rmarkdown document that's in the root of the project. That is what we're going to work off of. That is not the slides, but it has the same code that's in the slides for you to actually interact with. Okay? Any questions from those who are working locally? Just a quick point. If you do need help, please raise your hand and myself or Mark will come around and help you so you, she can keep talking. Okay. Um, for those of you who are wanting to test out the RStudio Cloud experience or simply don't have R and RStudio installed but would like to get going, um, go to this link. So that starts with the same uh, prefix and then has just the cloud at the end of it and that is going to land you on the RStudio Cloud page. It may ask you to log in. You should be able to log in with something like a Google or a GitHub account. If you have neither of these things, then it will ask you to create an account for yourself. What then it is going to land you in is something that looks just like the RStudio ID that you know, except it's running on the cloud. Um, so what you're going to do is start the assignment called ggplot2workshop. It says something is an assignment and it should have a start button for you. And it'll land you in the same place that your peer is working locally or doing, except on the cloud with all the packages that we need installed. So those of you working, wanting to work in our Studio Cloud, um, I just want to make sure that everybody's kind of like ready to go before we proceed from the slide. So, is there anyone who's still trying to get into cloud, or are we all good? Question. I got into cloud, but then what? Start the assignment called to the workshop. Yeah. So let's take a look real quick. Am I in it? Um, so if you go to projects. Mm, there we go. And then you should be able to hit start. That, I was missing that step over there. Uh, tip for if you're teaching with our Studio Cloud or really anything is to create a second persona for yourself. I have a second GitHub account and a second RStudio Cloud account actually that I've labeled Mina Student and log in as that person from an incognito browser to see what your students will see. I clearly have neglected to do that while I was doing this so I skipped that one step of saying click on the projects link because as an instructor and owner of that space I don't see that but uh, having that second account that you can run on an incognito browser will allow you to see exactly what your students will see. All right, so if the next slide was an exercise that asks you to do something, everyone feels ready to do so. Is that correct? Okay. Um, on the no. install packages here, those are taking a sec, so it's no big deal. Uh, yeah, and actually probably more than a sec for Tidyverse, eh? Right. <laughs> Uh, so um, let me grab those command lines and then you can move forward. Right, okay, sounds good. So it's the two packages, Tidyverse, and we're going to use ggrepel. I'll talk about what that is when we get to it. Tidyverse is a suite of packages. It has a lot of dependencies and takes a little bit of time to install. For those of you working in cloud, I've already installed it for you, so you don't have to do it. I'm ready now. Thank okay, you. alrighty. Any other questions before we proceed? Cool. So today we're going to work on two data sets. Uh, one of them is, uh, so these both come from Durham, where I live, 
Um, one of them is on transit ride data. So we have daily summaries of rides. So for each day in 2015, we have the number of rides taken, the number of stops and stuff like that. And we also have uh, Durham uh, registered voter data where we have one row per voter. Okay, um, These data were originally used as part of an analysis for kind of looking at um, access, like access to transit options for different um, kind of regions. That's not the depth of the analysis we're going to get into today, but that's the reason why these two seemingly unlinked files exist in the same project for me. So we're going to um, kind of read those files in and then move forward from there. So if you are working in RStudio Cloud or locally in RStudio, what I would like you to do right now, you should have this ggplot2 document. Um, and let me, how many of you have worked with R Markdown before? Okay, so we definitely have some newcomers to R Markdown, so I'd like to do like a brief demo. And if I didn't think it was important for learning other things in R, we would have completely skipped it because it's certainly a different technology than ggplot2. But I kind of take it as a given that for learning and teaching anything, doing it in an R Markdown environment is really helpful. So let's go ahead and actually work through it. So in this R Markdown document, one thing we could do, and I'm not going to do it just yet, is simply hit the knit button and see the entire thing, okay? Um, but other things that we're going to ask you to do along the way is instead of knitting the entire document and seeing the entire contents of the workshop, chances are you would prefer to proceed one by one throughout the chunks. So we have, um, I have very minimal text in this R Markdown file. The text is in the slides and in my narrative here, but all of the code you're going to need is here. So if you would like to run any line, any chunk of code line uh, one by one, Oh, the resolution is a bit odd, so you can't really see on the screen that this is gray, but on your screens you should be able to see that lines 11 through 15 are grayer than the ones around it. So that's the fencing of one of the R chunks, and that's our setup chunk, so that does things like loading the two packages that we want to load, and I can run that single chunk simply by uh, clicking on the green arrow next to it. And what you can see is that it actually sends it down to the console and runs it in the console. All right? So this is what your um, RStudio window looks like. However, what I am going to do um, is change things around a little bit and I'd like to do this kind of showing you just so you know what I'm doing and why my window is going to look a little bit different from you in a second. Um, I personally, when I'm working by myself, really like that this console is down here. It's not someplace I look at constantly, it's kind of just there for me. Um, however, when I'm teaching, this happens to be the place I'm constantly standing in front of and no one can see, especially people in the back. So I'm actually going to change my pane layout um, and put my console up here. So going forward, you'll be able to see my console up here. The plots are going to appear here, and my R Markdown file is here, and my environment is here. You don't have to do the same thing. I'm just showing you this because it's going to look a little bit different from you. Just to give you kind of the whole shebang, if you will, let's actually click on Knit. For those of you who are working on our Studio Cloud, when this document stops knitting, it might give you an error if you have a pop-up blocker in your browser because it's trying to, it's going to try to pop up the output window. And if you have a pop-up blocker, which most modern browsers have, it's going to complain about it, giving an error. That is not an R error. If you read it, it's about a pop-up. And if you simply hit try again, I think, you will be able to uh, see the resulting output. So our resulting output is going to look something like this. This is all we're going to work through today. I'm scrolling through it incredibly fast because we're actually going to go through it one by one. But I just wanted you to see that this document all works. So the code should all work. I'm sure we'll mess things up along the way. But at least you can be assured that the code in its like kind of raw format, if you want to come back to it after the workshop, is all working. All right? Any questions so far? 
So I'm going to start by loading the data sets that um, I talked about. So I'm going to go down to my next R chunk that is starting on line 27 and click the uh, run button for that chunk. And once I click the run button, I should be able to see in my environment a daily data set that has 364 observations and a Durham voters data set that has over 200,000 observations. If you actually wanted to just kind of peek at these, you could click on the environment and it'll pop up the data viewer for you to peek at them. Um, sometimes I like looking at the data like this just to get a feel for what's in there, though none of the real analysis is going to get done that way. So everyone has their data sets loaded? Alrighty. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do, and I do have these chunks one by one spelled out in your R Markdown document, so you can either watch or you can kind of run them uh, as we go along, is we're going to build a visualization. This is the visualization that we're going to build, okay? So what is happening in this visualization? Can somebody tell me what are the things that we are working with? In fact, what I'm going to ask you to do is work with a person next to you or behind you to answer the question, um, oh, we should say which of the two data sets, I'm sorry, which of the two data sets does this visualization use? The daily data set or the Durham voters data set? Determine which variable is what mapped to which aesthetic. And by that, what I mean is which variable is used for the x-axis, which is used for the y, so on and so forth. So go through the data sets that you have already loaded. This is not an exercise in running code. And I don't want you to be looking at the code. I want you to be looking at the data sets and kind of working your way backwards to what data sets and what are we actually plotting here. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to talk to the person around you to answer these questions and then we'll come back together. Yeah, I have a. I initially started with four, and it was getting a bit unwieldy, so we went down to two. I forgot to update that. All right. So, which data set are we working off of? The daily data set. Okay. Um, what are we pl plotting on the x-axis? The ride date, okay. Um, so let's take a look at ride date real quick. The, in the daily data set, the ride date variable is looks something like this. It is given kind of as a character string, if you will. 2015-01-01, 2015-01-02. But what we're seeing on the visualization is that that's been formatted to not actually exactly indicate that, but be a more like easily digestible date. So that is happening actually under the hood. This is not something, we'll see the code in a second. It's not something we're having to code up. It is something ggplot is recognizing that column as a date and making some judgment calls. Again, I said it's opinionated. It's making some judgment calls about what would be the best way to represent those data in the x-axis, which is quite neat because then you don't have to worry about undoing that um, the standard time that you would want to appear as the date value that you would want to appear as in your raw data but probably not in your final visualization. What do we have on the y-axis? The number of rights. So that's basically a one-to-one -one mapping from the variable to the y-axis. And then what else are we seeing um, in terms of the colors here? Which variable does it come from? 
the weekday, right? So the weekday is what it comes from. Um, this is not the order in which we would usually put days. What, what order are they coming up in? Alphabetical order, okay? So if we were bothered by that, we would want to fix that, okay? Um, we would want to fix that in the sense that it's a character variable. It doesn't look in and say, oh, these look like days of the week. Let me fix that for you because it was actually saved as a character variable. So if we wanted to fix that, we would have to do that ourselves. And lastly, what geometric object is used to represent the data? Points, lines, bars, box plots, lines. So that's another thing that we're going to see. So I called it a geometric object. Um, to be perfectly honest, if I wasn't speaking in ggplot2 terms, maybe that's not the wor word that I would use, but it'll make sense in a second why I'm calling it a geometric object. It's going to be a geom line is how we're going to indicate that. I don't want to put a dot for every um, data point. I want to actually connect them with a line. In addition, we have done a few other things here, right? There are some cosmetic touches to the plot as well. We have a um, title and a subtitle, and the way the variable names are showing up are not exactly the same way that they're showing up in our data set. So clearly, we've manipulated those strings to be a little bit nicer to the eye as opposed to machine readable. Okay, so in basic ggplot2 syntax, we start with data. We map those, the data to particular aesthetics, and then we use geom, geometric objects, to represent the data. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to start painting our uh, plot. So again, this is looking completely empty here, but on your screens, if you're looking at the slides, it shouldn't. Um, the, I think because of the resolution, there's a very faint gray color here, and that's not entirely showing up. But what we're going to imagine right now is we want to paint that picture we saw earlier. We're going to put our berets, we take out a canvas, and we're going to start painting. This, this first screen is a canvas, right? So what I have here is saying create a plot for me using the ggplot function for the daily data set. So that lays out an empty canvas for me. Then I say map the right date to the x-axis and map the number of rides to the y-axis. And these are called aesthetic mapping. So if you look at the syntax, the name of the argument is mapping. And the AES, short for aesthetic, is actually a function that that argument takes that does the mapping. So basically what it's saying is that column called ride date is going to be mapped to the x-axis. The column called n rides is going to be mapped to the y-axis. And now we can see the scale, but we're not seeing the data yet because we haven't yet told ggplot what geometric object it should use to represent the data. Now what I've said is for each data point in the data set, there were 364 of those, use a point to represent those data points, so that's a geom point, and I'm adding that on as a separate layer. I've laid down my canvas, I have identified the x and the y axes of my canvas and now in an additional layer I'm painting on my data and what I mean by an additional layer is I actually use the plus sign at the end to say this is going to go on a new layer. Okay. Syntax wise for R to actually be able to parse your code you do not have to use a line break after a plus. If you don't want kittens to die you do. Okay. <laughs> So, you, the reason why I, we would be using line breaks at the end uh, right after a plus is to actually indicate that we're layering this plot on one by one and we want it, our, our code to be as readable as possible. So yeah, R will oblige, but I will be sad if you don't use your line breaks. So we are going to keep that format. And, um, and the indentation, 
In the second line, also not mandatory for R to be able to read your code, but really nice and as we layer on more layers, it's going to be very obvious why that indentation helps us read. So now that we have the points, let's do one more thing. Now what I'm saying is, let's map one other variable from our data set to another aesthetic element. Not the x-axis, not the y-axis, but actually the color of the points. And now we have mapped the day of the week to the color of the points. Okay? Any questions so far? All right. Then what I'm going to do is I am actually going to change my geom and say instead of representing each data point, each observation with a point, actually use a smooth line, so that's a geom smooth, and it does it for me. It draws a smooth curve. This doesn't look exactly like what we saw to begin with, so like re try to remember that our original target. We're getting closer to it, but we're not there yet. It has some additional grayness around the lines. That's kind of like a measure of uncertainty, somewhat like a standard error that's being drawn on by default, and it's also giving us a warning. Our a warning in R doesn't mean the world has ended, but it does mean you probably want to tend to it. And ggplot tend to, tends to be quite verbose and says if there are certain things that it will be better if you made very clear in your code as opposed to just stuck to the defaults, it will give you a warning about it. So it says geom smooth is using a low S method. Um, with the formula y versus x. So basically it's fitting a smooth line using a low s method um, where the model is what the variable on the y-axis versus the variable on the x-axis. That's, that's exactly what we wanted but what it's telling you to do is make it a little bit more precise and actually say that in your code and then I will stop complaining about it. So all I've done is I've actually just said, okay, I'm not using a linear model, for example, I'm using a low S to do the smoothing, and I've made that clear to ggplot. If you think about the original plot we started with, it didn't have the grayness around it. That was a standard error, I said, for each of these, so we can actually turn that off with another argument to the... Um, to the geom smooth, and you can see that we're still in that same layer. We are in the geom layer where we're representing the data, and we're just making some modifications to make it look like what we wanted, as opposed to building on another layer on top of it. Next, we actually change the coloring. You can do a bunch of ways of coloring things. You can pick your favorite colors. Your favorite colors may not necessarily be the most readable colors, may not necessarily be the colors that would print nicely, may not necessarily be the colors that are colorblind friendly. So it is useful instead of haphazardly picking colors to pick a, a scale that is well defined and one of the scales that ggplot uses um, is the viridis scale. I personally like this color scheme so that's why I went with it. You can pick like a redder version of this as well if you want. So this I'm indicating it in another layer saying scale color viridis and D is for discrete as opposed to continuous because this is a discrete variable the day of week as opposed to a continuous variable that I'm coloring by. Then what I did is I actually took away the gray background, which is not necessarily, this one never had it anyway, this resolution, but on your, um, on your um, slides, if you're viewing them, this actually has a gray background, and this I've taken it away and changed the theme to be a minimal theme, so now the background is white, it's just your preference, whichever one you prefer. And finally, I've added some cosmetic elements to it. One of the things I've added is my axis labels. I also added a title and a subtitle. And I also changed how the legend appeared, the name of the legend appeared. So the labels that I'm using, X, Y, and color, map exactly to the argument names in the aesthetic function, as you can see. So if you had multiple legends, you could change their names similarly as well by referring to the particular variable that you're mapping to an aesthetic element. And this is the plot that we started with. So we started with, kind of, we saw the plot to begin with, and then we built our way up to it. Any questions so far?
Can I ask a silly yeah. question? If you were, if you wanted to put the actual lines for the X's, is this one of the things that you can't do? If you, if I wanted to, instead of so right now, I have a little line like this. Oh, no, you can actually. So if instead of theme minimal, you do theme black and white. So let's go ahead and do that. So let me show you. Um, so we are on line, line 106 of the, uh, our markdown document. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure everything up to that runs first in case there's any computation I need. So I'm going to click on this down button and let it do its thing real quick. Let's go ahead and then generate the plot here. So this is the plot that we had created. So there are different themes that you can use and one of them is theme black and white and that actually will put the box around it. If you just want, um, um, the reason I'm asking these things is because different journals ask for right. different things. So you can, you absolutely, so I... Not do the box, but just two. Right, so you just want the, um, the lines for the X and Y axis. Yes, that is doable. So we'll talk about playing around with theme elements towards the end of the presentation. That's going to be something, if it's not one of the predefined themes that does what you want, then you would go in and actually change the arguments to get what you want. And that is something that ggplot will happily let you play around with. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So, how do we make in general ggplots? First, we initialize a plot with the ggplot function and we basically pass our data to that. So that's always the first argument is your data. And then we add layers with the geom functions. And you can have multiple layers. So you can have the same data set represented with multiple geoms. You can have different data sets represented on a single graph. And that's, those are the kind of options that we're going to go through next. So we're going to talk about mapping. And I'm not talking about cartographic mapping. We're talking about mapping variables to aesthetic elements in our plots. I'm going to keep calling this mapping because that's the name of the argument in the ggplot function. And for sake of space on the slides, I'm actually going to drop the name of that argument at some point. So you won't keep seeing mapping equals. It's just under, ggplot understands that that's the element you're passing it with the aesthetic function. So what else can I do? So here what I've done is I have that same plot I've done before where I represent each observation with a point except instead of coloring by the day of the week I have sized the points by the number of riders. So bigger points actually mean more riders. Um, this is one of the bad scales I think you can use visually. People are not that good at comparing like how, is one circle bigger than another? But more importantly, what, what, this is hiding something, the way we have this set up. How could we fix, there's too much overplotting happening, and it's really hard to see like right around here, what is happening? Are these big, big circles or small circles? It's really hard to see. So one way we can fix that is we can actually change the transparency. So let's take a look over here. I have sized the points by changing the aesthetic element because what I've said is determine the size of the circle based on a variable in my data set. However, I have adjusted the alpha level in the geom layer saying make alpha 0.5. Alpha is a value that could range from zero completely transparent to one completely opaque. And that is not something that I am depending on a variable in my data set for, but instead personally choosing myself as a preference. So the way I think about these often is up there are my aesthetic elements, my aesthetic mappings, and these are my cosmetic choices, if you will. Okay, so that is something I have changed because of my personal preference versus the size is something that's being determined based off of a variable in my data set. That is what determines whether a variable or a value goes in the aesthetic mapping or the setting of the value. So, 
What I'm going to ask you to do is to add color, size, alpha, and shape aesthetics to your graph. So we, so far we've only used the points, the circles, for the shapes. I'm going to ask you to experiment a bit. And instead of kind of walking you through it, I've given you a link to the various kind of uh, specs that you can use in ggplot2. So you have the code in front of you and you have the link in front of you. Just do different things um, and see what happens when you actually change some of these elements. And also compare with the person next to you. I'll give you a few minutes to work on it. And I'm kind of hoping that this exercise will generate some additional questions that weren't clear to you when you were kind of like, when I was showing you how to uh, navigate the space. Any questions about what we're doing? All right, then play along. And if you have questions, just raise your hand and I'll come around. So I wonder, um, did you install the tidyverse? Oh yeah, you did. Okay. Mm, let's take a look. What I'm going to try doing is I'm going to try running everything up to this point real quick. Hmm. You're using your local R Studio, right? Yes. And probably something to do with some sort of a package version. So what I'm going to try is to look at your session info. Let's see which version of ggplot2 you're using. This is the version that you are using, ggplot2 2.2.1, right? So let me see what version I'm using real quick. You had 2.2 something, right? So you're using an old version of ggplot. So one thing that you can do is you can say, so there's a function called update packages. And you should be able to just give the name of the package or you can simply install the ggplot2 package by itself, just like this, okay? And that should get the new version for you. I think the version you're using is prior to when that function was made available. Mm -hmm. Give it a try if you have any other issues, let me know. If you make a plot where you're proud of and you are on our studio cloud, we could share it with the rest of the people. Did it work now? So one thing I would say is I wouldn't put commands like install and update in your R markdown okay. because those are things that you want to kind of run once versus <clears> things <throat> like loading the package you definitely want to. Okay. So um, in this particular case, so it did get um, loaded, so I would now um, load the package and then um, try running that code one more time. On the, on the plot thing and we don't know where it's going. I mean, where it's showing up. Hmm. Oh, it should be here? Yeah, I'm 
configured. Here, I'm gonna close this bit just to give you a bit more space. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. Something is up with the plotting window. So my recommendation would be, let's make sure this document is saved and let's kind of just like refresh, mm -hmm. see if see something was like, it, it, this is not a R error, it's more a like, maybe there was like a moment of disconnectivity or something mm -hmm. like that. So let's run everything up to here again. And then let's try running this one. Okay, so your plots are showing up directly in okay. here. Okay. okay. And then if you want to close out of them, you can like make them go away. They close the plots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anyone have a plot they have generated that they'd like to share? Yes. Do you want to walk me? Does anyone want to walk me through what they have changed here? Let me see. Any changes you would recommend we do so we get a slightly different output? No? You are benefiting from me not knowing your names. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what happens? We can have a label. Okay, so what kind of a label do we want? <laughs> so, so if we want to change, for example, um, one thing that we might want to do, okay, we have these smooth points, right? So instead of lines, let's change this to geom point, okay? And so something I like doing when I am trying things out is I don't want to just delete this line, like maybe I'll come back to it. So I would actually just comment this out um, and that'll go away and I can simply run this code and it should work. So this is the same plot except I'm using points instead of um, the lines to represent them. Let's take a look at the help file for geom point because maybe I don't like circles but I like triangles. How would I go about getting those on there? So in the help file let's try to see um, what are some of the changes that we might be able to make. So it seems like I might be able to change the shape, the size, the stroke, um, and the color and the alpha level of these things. So if I want to try to change the shape, I can't remember actually if this, yay, okay. So in a new recent version of GG, it used to be that you had to kind of not memorize, but there were one to 25 scale that um, I still have like pinned by my computer <laughs> in my office, the different things. But if you actually go to that link that I directed you to, now ggplot has support for like understanding some of the commonly used, so each of those 25 options has a name and you can actually use those. So here we've changed the shape and you can see that it automatically changes the legend as well. If you have used other plotting systems in R or in some other languages, there are some that require you to build the legend yourself and that can be a quite annoying um, exercise because you're having to partition your plotting space to place it there, having to keep track in your mind of which color maps to which level. So the fact that ggplot does the legending uh, automatically I would say is a huge plus uh, and a huge selling point for like getting to nice visualizations quickly. Do I know how, what do you mean how to copy and paste? Uh, I'm trying to just copy the link. Um, paste it, well, I was going to paste it into the code and use browse URL, uh, but I, I can't paste it. So you, you, when you copy the code itself? Uh, anything, whatever, just, I, I can't copy anything and paste it. I was trying to copy something and paste it. Is it from the console or is it from the, the environment in, or, uh, in the script? In the script. The copy paste should just work no. like copy paste. You may want to refresh to see if that'll help. Otherwise, no, it should work just like copy paste should work. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, I want to know if I define shape based on the weekday, 
but he does not work. It, it gave me a hero that there are seven, and if I have six, it will work. So well, so if you want to, so you said you want to make the shape based on the day of the week? But how would that work? So you're saying like use triangles for one thing, but you like yes. one day. So that would be so that would be an aesthetic element then. So it should be because we're mapping it to a variable. So what happens if we try? Is this what you tried? So the shape palette can deal with a maximum of six discrete values because more than six becomes difficult to discriminate. You have seven. Consider specifying shapes manually if you must have them. This is one of those instances where ggplot2 is saying, nah, -uh, I'm not going to let you, not easily, because that's not a good way to visualize the data. If you have seven different shapes, it becomes quite difficult to the human eye. So this is based on some kind of theory of data visualization saying at some point that's just making things busy. Now you can if you want do I think it's scale shape manual is what it would be the function and it will let you define and overwrite it but it's kind of making your life difficult and making you think twice and saying okay fine I won't do it. Uh -huh, you're welcome. <laughs> So in, instead of using shape as an aesthetic component, could we map on the first line days of the week to shape? It would uh, yeah. Explain again, but we if like yes. this four, so yeah. it would be one yeah. color, multiple shapes. Is that what would happen if we put it on that first? So line? if you don't have color, but you have shape here, is that what you mean? Yep. And we have this. You won't like it again. Because yes, it will give you the same error, but we have removed the color, so now it's not differentiating by color, it's only differentiating by shape. And Wednesdays are gone. The last level is just not being represented on the plot. Any other questions? Okay. So here is kind of a summary of what you're allowed to do. Um, so you can map discrete variables to color, size, or shape. Although, remember that when your levels are too high, it's going to start complaining for you for shapes. Um, you can map continuous variables to color as well. You can see the difference is that when you have a continuous variable mapped to the color, that's a gradient as opposed to discrete jumps. And you can also map a continuous variable to a size as well, and that's going to be kind of a similar deal. You can't map a continuous variable to a shape, though, because that's kind of like, it has no way of assigning them. That, if you think about it, a continuous variable is kind of like a discrete variable with infinite number of levels, which obviously is not going to work. Okay? So, the mappings, the, we gave an example of one mapping that we put at the geom level, right? The shape initially, I changed it at the geom level. So you can actually do that. In fact, you might see, come across some ggplot2 code where in the beginning, um, you only define the uh, data, and then for each of your geoms that you're using, you can define the uh, aesthetic mapping separately. It all depends on whether you want those aesthetic mappings to be shared across geoms or to be the same for each of the geoms. So we're going to give a few examples of ones that are shared and ones that are different. So here, this is the same picture we achieved before, except we've simply moved the mapping to the only geom level that we have. Over here, what we've done is the mapping of right ride date to the x variable and number of rides to the y variable is global. That's happening at the top level and that's a global assignment. The geom point then inherits both of those. So it places the black points based on the x and y assignments that are done at the global level. In the next level, 
In addition to inheriting that x and y, we're also specifying one other thing, saying the smooth lines should have different colors. So this is why the points themselves are not colored based on the day of the week, but the lines are. So this is kind of, you, we're starting to tweak things and uh, create different aesthetic mappings at the different uh, geom levels. Okay? So, setting versus mapping. We use the term map to map an aesthetic to a variable and we place that inside the aesthetic statement. So here we're saying the variable ride date is X and rides is Y and day of the week is the color. Okay? We use the term, uh, verb set for when we are setting an aesthetic to a value. That's what I was calling a cosmetic element, for example. Why are these points red? Because I love red. Why are these points colorful? Because the days of the week necessitate that they be different colors. That's the difference. So this is a user-defined color for all of the points that's shared all across versus this is being mapped to a variable in the data set. So the question is, do you want to map a variable or do you want to set an aesthetic choice? Let's talk a little bit about ggplot to syntax now. So there are, you can use uh, dplyr type pipeline syntax in a ggplot too as well. So the pipe um, operator that you're seeing on the first line over there, basically all it does is it takes what comes before it and places it as the first argument in what comes after it. So this is equivalent to saying ggplot2 and then data equals daily because that would be the first argument in the ggplot2. In this particular case I think this is a silly example. Why wouldn't you just put it in the ggplot function? But you can imagine a situation where if you already write dplyr pipelines you might manipulate a data frame and instead of saving that data frame out simply then pipe it into a ggplot to continue visualizing it. So you can also not name your parameters. So this is what I was saying where I'm going to stop uh, using the term mapping from now on and also stop using data equals from now on so that the first line is always starting with the data frame and then the aesthetic mappings but I've kind of not named them here. R will happily let you not name the first few arguments of any function. Um, you can also do variable creation on the fly. Not that I recommend it, but I'm saying that you can do it. So here, what we've done, and this is purposefully ugly, we'll fix it. Here what we've done is we're saying, um, take the daily data frame, map the ride data number of rides, and then color by the day of the week, except I don't want to see all of the days of the week. I just want to actually create a new variable that tells me whether uh, the day is a weekend or not. So what I've done here is I'm saying if the day of the week is in, how many of you use the in operator? This is I think my favorite operator in R because it makes you not have to write or statements. So instead of saying is the day Saturday or Sunday, I'm saying is the day in this vector Saturday or Sunday. If that is true, then it's going to show up as a true, otherwise it's going to show up as a false. So you can do this, looks pretty ugly, and I think it's not very clear. The ugly is fixable. Ugly you can fix in another layer of ggplot and make it not look ugly anymore. We can do that like this. So what I've done here is I've kept the first two lines exactly the same, except instead of making um, letting ggplot take the name of the legend where from the statement where the variable was created, I have actually overwritten it with a variable called weekend where it's either true or false. So that is fixable, but I would argue that this is still not very clear code. You should probably create that variable with a mutate statement or something ahead of time and then pipe the data frame into it because it becomes quite easy to miss what's happening there. Commenting this type of code is also going to be kind of tricky within your 
your ggplot statement. It is completely a personal preference and I can see how this may be a quick hack for something you're trying on the fly, but I think it's not very clear code writing for readability purposes later on. You can also pass the entire data frame in. So here basically what we're doing is starting a dplyr chain where we mutate and create that day type variable as a weekday or weekend and then pass that entire data frame in here. One thing I'd like you to take note of here is that I have done this indentation twice. So once for after the pipe to say this is a dplyr chain and then once for after ggplot2. This is a ggplot2 layering. Um, all of this is optional. The line breaks after the pipe operators, the line breaks after the pluses, but again what I'm telling you is you will make me very very sad if you don't put them there and I don't want you to make me sad. The reason is readability again. It is for you to be able to say in this line I'm doing one thing and one thing only and it is very clear where it starts and where it ends. Um, and let me show you a quick trick for doing this. So let's say that, you know, somebody was kind of just not being very good and didn't have their indentation proper. You can select their code, go to the add-ins in RStudio. There's a package called Styler and say style this selection and it will actually do the styling for you. So. Sometimes in the heat of data analysis it is possible that you know arguments are flying all over the place. This is a really nice thing. This is something I try to remind myself to do if I'm using git before I do a commit or if I forgot um, do it right after and make another commit saying didn't change anything just styled stuff. I also like running it on my students code just to make it readable. Okay. A few common early pitfalls in ggplot. One of them is mappings that aren't. So what is happening over here? What's the issue? Color is coded red and labeled blue. Yeah, why? And there's a U and we're in America. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> kidding. Blue is a variable. Blue isn't a variable. Blue was not a variable in our daily data set. We know that. So, right. So, if we want to make all of the points blue, it should be outside of the aesthetic statement. But why? What? What? What is this doing? It's reading what you're writing, but not. So what it is, correct, so what it's inherently doing is imagine it's, it's adding a new variable to our data frame that has the character string blue as every single observation in it. So it's like adding a new column with observations called blue. There's only one level of it and that's the one that goes into the legend. And these, it's using this pink reddish color because that's the first color in the ggplot scale. Okay? This is definitely not what we wanted to do, but it's just making an assumption that saying, I guess this is what you meant. <laughs> um, and that is not what we meant. So if we actually wanted to do that, as you said earlier, we would take color outside of the aesthetic mapping and instead make it a setting. So that is one common pitfall and I think the, the difficulty often comes from this being such a bizarre interpretation of what's happening. Um, what is wrong with what's happening here? So I have not used a plus sign, I've instead used a um, pipe operator inside ggplot2 and actually nowadays ggplot will tell you that's probably what you did. So it can't fix it for you, it's not going to just let you pass, but uh, in early versions of ggplot this was an issue that people came across because it used to give an incredibly cryptic error. Um, and this is a very honest mistake. If you're using these two packages, 
you kind of would like to be able to use the same operator. I believe Hadley has gone on the record saying if there was a pipe operator when I did ggplot2, I probably would have used it, but it's kind of too late to change things now. So it is true that these two operators exist, but at least it gives you a useful error message that you can fix it with. All right, let's talk a little bit about building our plots up layer by layer. Are there any questions? Yeah? Sorry, I did not understand for the previous slide. So that means we need to add a plus sign after the... Right, so we would want a plus sign right here. So in ggplot2, the operator we use between the layers is a plus versus in dplyr, the operators we use between the chains in the pipe is a pipe operator. So this should have been a plus, and so R tries to help you by saying, is that what you did? So if you actually change the code to make this a plus, it shouldn't give the error anymore. Okay? You're welcome. Okay. So here we have a basic plot that we've seen before. Now what I've done is I've added another geom to it, okay? So i am added a geom line, which is not like some smooth line, right? That's a geom smooth, so this is kind of a connect the dots type of situation, is what it's doing. And then, or I can add a geom smooth and I can change the smoothing parameter. That was one of the examples I gave in the earlier talk about we can kind of take a look at what happens as we change the span. It either gets more jagged or more smooth. I can also kind of add um, a grouping variable, so a color here. So now, because that is defined as a global aesthetic, it's being applied to both the point and the line. So both my points and my lines are colored in the same scheme. And because it's being applied to both, you can see that in my legend, I actually have both of the signs, uh, show, both the points and the lines showing up here as well. Again, these, like, this customization of the legend is something that's kind of cumbersome to build by hand, but ggplot will build them for you on the fly. Now we finally have something maybe a little bit more workable. This was looking a little bit crazy, in my opinion, the previous one. Maybe we, something like this seems a little bit more like what we might want, where we have smooth lines for each of our uh, days. In this particular case, I've actually used a different span for it than the original picture that we had made. So let's take a look at controlling data by, uh, by layer now. So what is happening here? I have, two, I have defined geom point twice, okay? So I have two sets of points on this uh, visualization. One of them, and actually it's the second one here, inherits everything that I had on the first line, and the other one is doing something crazy. Can anyone kind of help me walk through what that se this second uh, layer, this geom, is doing? Uh, for the weekdays, the rise that is less than 200 by the color gray. So for data points where, so it's not taking the entire daily data frame, but it's filtering it for um, weekdays, right? It's not in Saturday or Sunday. The exclamation point is a not. And the number of rides is less than 200. So those are basically saying, these seem kind of unusual. It's a weekday. We would expect more usage, but the number of rides is low. It is saying, use points that are size 5, so bigger than what we were using before, and color gray. And so those are those points that are basically looking like we have almost like circled around certain points to highlight them. And why do we have the, let's see if I have this, sorry, so why do we have the um, layer this layer come up before this layer. 
so the two overlap the color. Right, so that we actually can see the smaller points from under the gray, right? Otherwise, these are completely opaque and it would actually cover them up. Okay? So, this, yeah? yeah on, on that sort of vein, can, so let's say you had a. Uh, so, a question about ordering the plots. Uh huh. Talking order plots, about mm -hmm. order points. So, so, right now, the Fridays are plotted first, looks like. Right. There's mm -hmm. there. so, so is there a way, how do you ask um, GT plot to make sure the Sundays are on top? Right. So the, in that case, what we're saying is that the, the fact that we're doing Sundays are on top is because that's how like the calendar works, right? So it's not based off of another measurement, but we want it to be like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So there isn't, to my knowledge, a predefined order of days thing in R that we can call on. So that would be like we would be manually releveling a variable. So we can go ahead and do that. So we would want to manipulate the day of the week variable to have the right ordering in the levels first and then have ggplot use it. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go to control data by year, okay? And I will do a variable creation on the fly here just kind of to show what's happening. The function that I would use is from a package that I love the name of called for cats. It's for factors. It's just the I'm a cat. I have four cats, so <laughs> that's why I like it. So uh, the function is factor relevel, I believe. And what it does is it takes the name of the variable you want to relevel and then the order in which the level should appear. So we said, this kills me, but I will go along with it because I am from a place where we properly start the week on a Monday. <laughs> I mean, on Sunday mornings, when you wake up, do you feel like the no. week is starting? No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so it was Thursday. So I need to make sure that I'm matching the um, spelling. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, including the casing, Sunday. Oh, whoops, sorry, yes. Yep, I am. I'm going to do this just to make it a bit more readable. Let's see. Can't add ggpro to object. Did you forget to add this plot to... Did I? Did I forget to do something? Oh, there we go. I'm missing one other thing. Um, I don't think so. Oh, here we go. I'm missing a close parenthesis. So let's escape out. Sunday, Monday. It didn't like the way I... It's Tuesday. Okay. Still doesn't like it, so let's cheat. I will say, give me the unique values in day of week. What did I misspell? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. This shouldn't be complaining. Let's try one more time. Oh, actually, I think it's not complaining. It's just, it is doing it, right? Yeah. But what's the problem here? <laughs> I mean, it took the expression that I wrote and put it there. So it is not an issue, but it's an example of why that's not a good way of doing it. So how could we actually do this better? Let's create that variable ahead of time. Um, so what I will do here is say, start with the daily data set, mutate the day of the week using that same expression that we wrote earlier. P 
pipe that into our um, chain. So if I pipe it in, I shouldn't have to define the data again. So I can get rid of this. And then for color, I'll say use the newly created. So because it's being piped in, it'll use the newly created version. So this should hopefully give me what I want. There we go. Okay? It only took four tries, not bad. <laughs> Okay, so in this case, this is um, something that you would want to decide. If this is something you're going to want to carry across all of your plots, which I assume you would, you probably would want to do something like resave the data frame with that change in place so you don't have to keep repeating the mutate statement. But if you're mutating something only for the sake of one plot, you may not want to resave it over and just like leave it in the pipeline like this. Any other questions? All right. So we kind of gave away the um, answer to this question, but this is just another way of kind of getting at the same thing where, oh, actually, no, there's more happening here. So I will have you work on this exercise. Part of it we kind of worked through, but there's more happening here. So work with the person next to you. If there isn't someone next to you, turn around. Don't cheat. Don't run the code. Don't look ahead. Try to think through what this might be doing, OK? Water fountain. Okay, thanks. You guys want to chat? Uh, we can. Uh, we're looking at data points that are on the weekend or less than 100 riders. So they're now on the right. On the dot side. So we can see the very first thing we're calling it. Thank you. All right, what are we thinking? How will this, how will the result of this be different from the previous one that we saw? We're adding one more layer with text, and what is the text that we're adding? Right. So we're describing, um, so we have another layer for the low weekdays, which we're defining to be less than 100 here. And we're actually placing that text onto the plot as well. And where are we placing that text? So what are the x and y coordinates of where we're placing that text? The x coordinate comes from, since no x is defined here, it's going to come from the global level. So that's going to be ride date. And the y coordinate, since there's a new one defined here, it's going to take this one is going to overwrite the y coordinate coming from the global layer, which means 
wherever the y coordinate of that point is plus a little bit just to not be smack on top of the point that we have. Okay? So let's take a look. The low weekdays is basically this new data frame. There are only nine observations that meet the criteria so this basically tells me um, nine rows and seven columns so nine observations that meet the criteria these are those dates do any of those dates seem like important dates Holidays. January 1st is one of them Christmas Two seventeen is I think Martin Luther King Jr. Is it not? No. Not February. Day, yeah. Oh, maybe President's yeah. Day. Okay. So some of these are holidays that we might be able to recognize, and maybe that's why, even though they happen to fall on a weekday, we're seeing low usage. So this is what the original plot looked like. Let's add the gray points and you can see that because I've added those points as the second layer on top of the original point, I've basically lost them. They've been taken over. So here I actually swap the layers so that the colored points can be plotted on top of the gray ones. Then I add the text. Doesn't look very good. <laughs> then I raise the text up by 15 points. So it looks a little bit better. This still looks like crap to me. <laughs> and good luck solving that puzzle. Like, systematically raising them up by 15 points is easy. To solve this puzzle, what do we need to do? We have to, like, move things around. And you can do one of two things. You can go crazy moving them around one by one, or you can Google, did someone solve this, please, already? And that's where the GG repel package comes into play, okay? So it basically repels the points, and it actually uses a kind of a random algorithm for doing that. In fact, if you rerun this document over and over, you will see the placement of those uh, numbers are going to change a little bit because it is kind of randomly trying spaces and seeing if they overlap and starts with a random like seed each time so you could you know set a seed and like position them at the exact spot or just kind of let it be this basically what it's doing is it's either placing it somewhere near the point so this is using the what I've done is I have changed the last layer to use the function geom text repel from the gg repel package and you'll see that the API changed a little bit as well the syntax is a bit different I now have to define all of my um, aesthetic mappings uh, it doesn't borrow anything from the top layer so I've had to define everything over but I can get away with something pretty similar to me, this still doesn't look very clear. So if my data was sparser, I could probably get away with this look, but it still doesn't look very clear. So there's another option, geom label repel, where it will actually place the labels. However, this time the labels are opaque white and they're covering over some points. I don't know, pick your poison, okay? These are two pretty good options for solving this problem. If this is not solvable by this, it doesn't mean it is not solvable, but I think you may start getting creative with, could we make the plotting area a bit bigger? Do we really have to label all of these things? Could we just maybe use different shapes and then in our narrative describe what those are as a separate table as opposed to annotating them directly on the image? So there are a variety of approaches you can use, but I think this GG Repel package is a like a wonderful package for this type of annotation without causing you a whole lot of headache that it's worth trying doesn't always give you a perfect result though okay alright so let's think through this a little bit what happened here I asked how would you fix the following plot because I'm kind of finding it hard to believe this is what you would want to do what happened So on the top level, in our aesthetic mappings, I wanted ride date and rides, and I wanted colored by day of the week, but I only have one line. Give it a try. 
you have the code in front of you, so try a few approaches to see if you can either get the colored lines back, or better yet, get seven different lines, each of which are blue. The second option? Yeah. So we want the uh, grouping by day of the week, but we want all of them to be blue lines as opposed to different colors. I mean, it's unclear from the question that I pose which one would be the correct fix, but this certainly doesn't seem like the intentional plot to get. In our Studio Cloud? Yeah, it shouldn't matter. Like huh. even when I break a look and hit copy and write hit and click these, nothing happens. What kind of uh, operating system are you on? Oh, I wonder if it's in a um, that is not something I know off the top of my head. It works in other releases though. Like copies I think right or Did you and you tried logging off and logging back on and stuff? Okay, let me... <laughs> well, that's still not a good enough answer, though. Let's see. couldn't quickly find, but it, it is possible that the issue is the operating system and our studio cloud. Do you know what the operating system in the cloud is? It's probably Linux, right? Mm -hmm. well, that's bizarre, too. I guess that's true. Flavors or whatever they call. I don't know, I'm not much of a Linux person. Yeah. I'm trying to use the one because it's helpful. Yeah, um, I'm not, I, I'm curious, so I'm going to look into this, but I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. a deal, it's just, I was trying to copy some text and then try different things. So this is right, kind of yeah. It's nice to go with copy and paste. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah. That's what you want to do, right? Yeah. So how did you get it? I just did, did the group. group yeah. And took out the mm -hmm. And that, that's like, like, I already put it there. It's like, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Okay, so let's take a look what are the things that one might be trying to do here. So one option is you only wanted one line anyway and you just wanted that line to be blue, then chances are all you wanted was this, okay? That would be saying do not color it by anything, simply give me one smooth line that's blue. Now, given that we originally had this here, it makes me think was the intention this, which is the picture that we've been seeing so far. I'm just going to turn this standard error off just to make the look make it look a like, little bit easier to see in that small window. Was this the intention? Well, if that was the case, why was the blue added? So one other possibility is what we wanted was we want the seven different lines to be fitted uh, for each of the day of the weeks. However, we don't want them to be actually colored automatically by ggplot2 scale, but we just want them to be the color blue. So there what we're missing is, so then we have the color equals blue here. There what we're missing is that there is actually another argument that we can use, another aesthetic mapping called group as opposed to color. Okay? So what ggplot2 internally does is if you have multiple aesthetic mappings it creates this like these mutually exclusive groups under the hood and then uses that to kind of uh, fill up your plot. You usually don't refer to the groups because that is not, it doesn't have a visual indicator. In fact, if you are a dplyr user, I kind of think about that as the group by in the dplyr pipeline as well because when you group by a variable, a data frame, it doesn't actually do anything to it that you can see. It just does it under the hood and like, separates these different buckets for the different levels of your variable so that subsequent calculations are repeated for each of the groups but it's not an arrangement by groups for example so this is a similar idea so if the idea was that you didn't want to color them you just wanted to group them then use the group argument this is something you probably come across little uh, like less often in examples and blog posts and stuff like that because I don't know it seems a little bit silly maybe to do this <laughs> like you either want to see the differences or you don't want to see the differences but the idea is that it is possible you just want to not tell it to uh, make them blue so letting ggplot pick colors first and then overriding them is not the way to go Instead, what we're telling ggplot is to do some grouping, not assign colors to it, and then in the next layer, we are imposing our personal preference for what color those should be. Okay? If you want to manually give it different colors because you don't like the ggplot scale itself, then that's a scale color manual is what you would do in a different layer like we've done earlier. Okay, so other geoms, there are many other geoms that you could uh, look through. So just to give you a few ideas of some that are interesting to use um, that I've, I like. I mean, box plots are useful in a statistical setting and density plots as well. These hexagonal plots, I think, look super nice um, if you're looking at kind of density heat map type things. So you can actually, what it's doing is if you have lots of observations, instead of indicating every single one of them with a point, it's binning them into hexagons, basically. And then the count is indicated by the, um, the continuous scale that it's giving in. Um, other ones, you can do mapping with ggplot. I didn't want to get into that today because I feel like that's like its own thing. <laughs> like that could be very well its own two hours if not more. But it is absolutely possible to do mapping in ggplot and it um, kind of builds off of the, a lot of the newer functionality builds off of the SF package if you've used that. Can I give a shameless plug? Yeah. I'm teaching mapping in R on May 15th. There you go. 
that's the place to go to get that information. Um, so here are the kind of the different um, SF functions that you can basically use. So there's a lot, as you can see, um, and there are really nice examples for it as well. In terms of reading through the docs, I like going here because the images are actually rendered as opposed to the kind of the package docs that come in, um, like in the R help there you don't see the images right away sometimes what I'm doing in terms of looking through these is literally clicking on the geoms one by one to be like is that what I want is that what I want and then I figure out what the name of it is So let's talk a little bit about facets now. So what I have here is I have created two new variables. One of them is day and that basically has two levels, weekend or weekday. And the other one is temperature, bless you, and that has either cooler or warmer. Well that was stupid though because those are not the cooler months. Um, let's, f let's fix it, okay? Let's just fix it because that, that I don't like. Um, okay, so let me go ahead and fix the slides real quick. I will push the change slides um, up later. So the cooler months should really be January, February, March, and December, November, and October, right? Okay. Let's let the slides render. So because I've done these slides in our markdown, that should simply propagate to the rest of the images and stuff. Everything should be updated. And what I'll do after the workshop is I'll push the updated version onto GitHub so you can get a record of that as well. can see some of my bad behavior. I haven't named my chunks. So <laughs> if I had, we could actually see what we were doing. Um, but you can always see what chunk number it's referring to here as well. Okay, so there we go. Let's go quickly to where we were. You know, not too bad for recovering from a stupid mistake. Okay, so the temperature is either cooler months or warmer months. And the reason why I created these two variables is in order to show faceting, I wanted to have some categorical variables that had not too many levels so that things could fit on the slides for demonstrative purposes. Um, and one thing that I'm doing here is I have just to be able to show you what the data looks like, I have pulled forward the new variables that I created day and temp and then said and everything else comes after them. So I've just reordered the columns in my data set just so when I print them you can see them but it has no other purpose other than that. And this everything function is pretty handy in dplyr because then I don't have to type the rest of the variables in. Okay. So one of the things that I might do is instead of coloring by um, a variable, I might actually split my data. This is especially helpful when you have larger data sets um, where simply at having all of those points within or the lines, like especially if you're using points, having all of them in a single plot is not that useful at some point. So if you wanted to compare kind of trend on weekdays versus weekends throughout the year, we can facet it. And um, I know the x-axis labels aren't looking nice, but that's going to be your exercise to fix later. So for now, they're not looking nice here. They maybe are looking nice on your end when you run the R markdown because you're working on a different resolution here. Um, but so let's forget about them for a second. So the function that we're using here is facet wrap, and that is the function we use when we are faceting by a single variable. 
And what it does is it will put the uh, different levels next to each other. And it is smart about the number amount of space that it has, that if it had many more levels, at some point it will start using the next line and basically create kind of a wrap around. Okay? You may want to facet by two variables though. So here what I have actually are four different panels. Um, weekends and weekdays and for cooler and warmer months. And the reason why we're seeing this line here is what? Right, exactly. So the geom uh, line basically does a connect the dots type thing and these are the months where we have identified as warmer so it's simply connecting them even though there's no data there actually. So what we've done here is we have temp versus day and the temperature is placed on the y-axis and day is placed on the x-axis. So just like matrix notation, it's always y versus x or model notation. So y-axis versus x-axis. If I flip them around, then it puts the day on the y-axis and temp on the x-axis. So it depends on which one you prefer at that point. But so we use facet grid when we are um, faceting by two variables and facet wrap when we're faceting by a single variable. Any questions about that? Okay, so let's take a look at this. So I'm going to move on to the other data set and kind of walk you through what's here first and then we will um, kind of look at one other visualization. So we have the Durham voters data set and I've purposefully only showed you three variables so they would fit here. It's not like we're getting rid of the other ones but we're interested in the race code variable. So for example, W stands for white, B for black, so on and so forth. Gender code, um, I think it has three or more levels, I'm not sure. There's male and female and a few other levels. And then an age variable that's categorical, that's bin data as well. So each one of these rows represents a voter in Durham. And so one of the things that we've done here is I've actually done some summarization so I have counted the number of voters and the number of Republicans, okay? So the way I've done that is by creating a summer, uh, using the summarize function. So for each age group and for each race code, gender code and age group category, I'm counting how many people fall in that group and then how many of those are Republicans. All right, so there were only two Asian uh, females under the age of 18 in this group that were voters and zero of them were Republicans, for example. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually uh, filter the data to only include the males and females those uh, defined or coded as white, black, or Asian in the race code and remove people less than 18 because they're not supposed to vote. Mm -hmm. So that's why we remove them. Okay? All right. So let's take a look at this real quick. So we have now created a, a bar plot, a faceted bar plot on the y-axis of it we have the race code so Asian black and white and on the x-axis we have the gender code that we have filtered to only be female and male again the axis labels we're gonna get to in a second so what this is showing me is um, or actually let me show you one other plot same plot with one argument changed and you tell me what's different between this one and this one so this was the first one, and this one the second one. Scale. Scale. So we've freed the scales. <laughs> so what the first one is doing by default is it's keeping the same scale on the y-axis for each one of them. It's doing it for x too, but that we're not seeing a difference there because we have representation in each of the age groups. So because this bar is so tall, close to 20,000, it's making the y-axis go up to 20,000 for each of the categories. That might be helpful if the question you're asking is how do these um, 
race groups compare to each other. So you can see from this graph that in Durham there are fewer um, Asians at the voting age than blacks or whites, right? So if that's the question you're asking, this may be the right scale. If the question you're asking is more about what's the distribution of um, various age groups within each gender, uh, sorry, within within each race category that we're not trying to make a comparison across the races but just looking within then you may want to free the scales so that they only go up up to whatever is required for that particular bin. Does that make sense? And we're doing that by either freeing the Y, you can do free X or you can do both basically. And here we have something else, so what is this showing? I'll show you the code for it in a second, but what is this showing? The same, but using, not using geo bar. You're right. We're not using geom bar. So it is kind of the same in the sense that the pink dots are actually where the heights of those bars were. All right? Um, and this is the scales are freed here. And the blues are actually the Republican voters. So this can give us a sense of, like, within each of the groups, what percent roughly are Republican. Visually, we can maybe compare these distances. Okay? So how do we get this? This is a little bit more complicated. And maybe we have just enough time to go through it. What's that? Right, so we're going to do G online, exactly. But one of the things that we need to do is now we need to make sure that we actually can create a categorical variable that tells me for each one of the rows whether it's about all voters or the Republican voters. So I will here um, introduce you to a new function that is in actually the development version of TidyR, but I think it's like... So I don't know if you've used the TidyR package before. There are these functions called gather and spread, and they allow you to uh, turn data frames from wider to longer. So if I give an example here, so as you can see, this is a what this is kind of a we can make this data frame longer by creating two rows for each of the rows that are existing here. And so instead of 2 and 0 being next to each other, 2 and 0 would be underneath each other. And we would have another variable that says this one is all and this one is Republican. So that would be making the data frame longer by multiplying its size by 2, basically, creating... Um, Yes, multiplying by two because we're going to keep the zeros, but otherwise it may not be. So it is making it longer. So we can make that move with the, um, new, this new function called pivot longer. There are other ways of doing it. It doesn't require this new function. I just actually understand this function, so that's why I use it. And the other ones, I do understand it, but have a little bit harder time articulating it. Um, so I'm excited for when these will be released, maybe sometime in the summer, I'm not sure. But basically what I said is that take the columns that start with N underscore. So I was smart about it earlier and name those columns N underscore voters and N underscore rep. And so I'm saying take the columns that start with N underscore and then convert to a new uh, variable called voter type. And then the values in those, the 2 and the 0, for example, are going to go to a new column called N. And then actually I said then get rid of the N underscores in the names of the variables. So then what we can see is this, instead of saying N all voters and N rep voters, it's saying all voters and Republican voters. So it allows me to create this new variable called voter type and then I can use that as my coloring variable. There are other ways of getting at that by manually drawing those lines, but I think a really, really nice way of thinking about how most effectively to use ggplot2 is to think, what can I let the data frame handle for me and I can simply map to an aesthetic as opposed to me acting like I genuinely am painting on this canvas, okay? Yeah? Mm -hmm. that, that's 
so oops. Because you probably don't want the, so the prefix is what you get used to catch them. So it was the n underscore. So I probably don't want that anymore because n now became a different column. And so I probably want whatever the qualifier of those were, which is the rest of it. So that's why the names prefix is used, yeah. Um, I will say that these are, that is a kind of a development version of the function. Um, I, I believe, based on latest conversations with Hadley, that the names pivot longer and pivot wider are staying, and I don't anticipate a lot of instability to the arguments there, but, you know, don't hold me to it. <laughs> um, I do think it's a, uh, pretty neat to be able to do that because it allows you to get that column out and soon as you can put something into a column, ggplot has wonderfully easy ways of making you put them onto the graph. If you're having to manually calculate these numbers yourself and passing the actual values to be plotted onto the plot, that's doable, but in my opinion that's more gymnastics and it is not necessarily what ggplot was you know, designed to actually work nicely with. All right, so I wanted to give this as like kind of the most complex example we get to, just to show, and, and complex in the sense of like one of the more, more complex things you can do with data like this, where we're doing a pretty hefty data manipulation stage that we're then feeding into a ggplot that we kind of figured out how to use earlier. Um, and I will say that I think for like working through this, running it line by line is probably the best way to go, but something to keep in mind the takeaway message again is try to create a variable of what you want then you'll be able to use it <laughs> even if it's in a different data frame remember we learned how to pull things in from different data frames too but try to create it get it into a variable in a data frame and then ggplot probably has a nice way of helping you with it um, lastly, let's talk about scales and legends. So there are some things that you can do that are transformations. So what did we do here? I added a new layer called scale y reverse. What did it do? Yeah, so now they go from 0 to 500. I think it's a silly example here, but if you had things like months or whatever, like you may think about um, like starting with January up here and then going down this way, for example. I'm literally, as I'm talking to you, realizing that two days ago I tried to solve this problem in a stupid way and couldn't, and now I'm going to go back. And like it was a completely different thing, and I like I had this in another file, and I didn't make the connection. Okay. Um, Scale transformation, so you can also do transformation. So here we did a square root transformation. When you have really large values, maybe like extremely right skewed data, you could do a uh, log or a square root or something like that. So these are ways of playing around with the visualization without touching the data. Um, off, another way of doing this, obviously, is by mutating the column and feeding it into it. And I think it's up to you how you want to play around, but there are certain uh, facilities ggplot2 gives you that if you feel like instead of data manipulation, you want to just like play on the visualization side, you can do that. So in that example, the labels kind of inaccurate should be square root of the number of rides on the y-axis? Oh, yes. This should be the square root of the number of rides, yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you, even if you do that a lot, it doesn't, it's going to leave the variable link there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you would want to manually edit that. Yeah, and that's not, yeah. Yeah, right, even though, like, and it, yeah, the actual numbers will change. Like, if you do a log and you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's true. Because that axis becomes the actual transform, whatever. The transform, yeah, that's why. Actually, if you can see it um, on, on your end, like on the slides in your on your computer, you should be able to see that the grid lines here are bigger and here they're a lot smaller. Um, doesn't show up uh, really nice here. I think this is a takeaway message that for teaching materials, maybe theme black and white is the way to go as opposed to gray because it's so faint that it's hard to tell whether what you're seeing is going to show up um, on the um, on the resolution here.
So you can also change the scale. So it was giving like, uh, for every 100 it was placing uh, a break, but you can actually manually define your breaks if you prefer. And then uh, let's talk a little bit about themes. I think this is the fun bit, not the refined ones. That's like the sticky bit that I'll make you work on to end with. But I think the themes are fun. So this is the black and white theme, okay? This is the dark theme. Um, there are other themes, and actually some of those other themes are pretty fun. There is a um, XKCD theme. So you can make your POS look like XKCD images. Um, What's the director of the Royal Tenenbaums? There's a Wes Anderson theme, so the colors are look like uh, Wes Anderson movies. There is also like an Economist theme, so like that's what the Economist uses the uh, magazine. So like you can get these things, and there are other themes that you can develop for yourself. There are companies that develop their own themes, so if you like certain set of colors, you can do that. I am kind of obsessed with. Pantone's fashion colors every year. I update my materials according to those, so I make themes to follow those. <laughs> I don't know. I just visually try to distinguish. Hmm? That's the color standard. Yes. Yes, exactly. I don't, I don't wear those colors, so I don't think I can pull those off, but I make my graphs that way. Um, so so you, can, you can change them and play around with them and build your own themes, but you can also, without building your own themes, I think that's like a next step up if you really want to do that, you can change different elements about it. So you were asking about, can I only put these lines and not the rest of the box? And that is something that you will do with the theme argument. So here what we've done is we have actually turned, this is bad visualization by the way, I don't know why I decided to end on a bad note, but you know, anything you have to go like this is probably not good, but if you have really extensive um, kind of like if your um, labels are really long you may put them at an angle or something, so one of the things that you might think about is how would we maybe put them at a different angle so they don't overlap, so instead of 90 we could choose a different angle there, for example. So the last example I was going to ask you is to fix the um, axis label here to, be, to make it a bit more readable. And I realize that on your resolution it may be readable, but <laughs> it is not on mine, so fix it for me. So we'll give, you, um, we'll give you just a couple minutes to try it out using the code from before, and maybe that'll Bring up any last questions that you might have, and then I'll give you a few more resources uh, before we wrap things up. All right, shall we give it a try? So I'm going to cheat a bit and copy the theme argument from here. Let's go ahead and run this, and we can see that they are kind of overlapping. Um, so something you might try instead of 90 degrees is maybe 45 degrees. I've seen this certainly on plots. Oh, just stop. No, you don't want to cooperate? Oh, I know what's happening. It's still building my slides from before. Okay. 
All right, we're going to shut down our studio, I think. Go away. Okay. Uh, so that package that I was telling you about, the slide making package, it has this wonderful ability to like rebuild the slides every time you save. Well, if you're a save happy person like me, it rebuilds them even when you don't want them to. So that's what it's doing right now. Um, so let's go ahead and add this here and maybe make it 45 degrees and see what that looks like. So that looks okay, but there's an issue with it. Mm -hmm. Right now they turned 45 degrees, but they are now overlapping. So I think another thing you can do is add an adjustment to it. Uh, kind of making up that number. There we go. So that kind of like shifted them over. So that might, that's still a little annoying to me, to be honest, but not as annoying as the 90 degree. Mm -hmm. You may want to flip the whole thing around and see if this should be the y axis and this should be the x axis. There are a variety of things you might consider. All right, so to end things with, um, there is a themes vignette where you can actually go through all of the elements and think about how to create your own theme if that's something you're interested in. So to recap, this is the basics that I would kind of want to um, leave things with. We map variables to aesthetics. We add geoms for visual representations of observations. We can manage the scales independently for geoms and for different variables. The legends are automatically created and you can actually create some of the statistics by the geom. So that, for example, the low S curve, I didn't have to fit a model initially. It does some of the standard stuff itself. Um, this is a general ggplot template that I borrowed from the cheat sheet and if you're not familiar with RStudio cheat sheets, they're quite handy. So I would recommend like Googling RStudio cheat sheets. There's one for all of the, each of the ma uh, packages that RStudio um, maintains. And this is kind of a nice kind of thing to think about. These you always need to have, data, geom and mapping. The rest is all optional. So if you kind of have this mental model in your head, it might be easier to start building your uh, plots from scratch. And here are some um, references for places to look in terms of reading. Um, there's the very obvious R4 Data Science book. There's a new edition of Winston Chang's Graphics Cookbook, and I'm particularly fond of Kieran Healy's new data visualization book that uses ggplot. And I want to thank uh, my Our Ladies co-organizers in RTP, Elaine McVeigh and Sheila Sai, who have previously also ran this workshop. So this is an iteration of some of the stuff they've worked on too. Thank you very much. If there are any quick questions, I can answer as I pack. Otherwise, I have a very distinctive name. I'm sure you can find me, and I'd be happy to answer anything on the internet as well. Mina Chetinkaya Rundell. You're welcome. Uh huh. Check. Yeah. Yeah.